when the Buddha lists the various conditions that go into suffering, that lead to suffering, he starts out with the way that ignorance conditions are fabrications. It sounds pretty abstract, but it's actually a very useful tool for understanding what we're doing and how we can learn how to do it more skillfully, and how we can step back from the way we ordinarily create suffering and learn how to fabricate in ways that are actually more skillful, because after all, the path itself is a fabrication. We put together right mindfulness, we put together right concentration, all the other factors of the path are things that are put together, which is what fabrication means. It doesn't mean you know, total lies or unreality. It simply reflects the fact that we do shape our experience. We do it in three ways. There's bodily fabrication, which is the breath. That's what we're focusing on right now. You breathe in, breathe out, you're fabricating your experience right there. And there's directed thought and evaluation that's called verbal fabrication. These are the things you say to yourself, all the different voices in the mind. Pick up a topic and you make a comment on it. Directed thought is picking up the topic, evaluation is the comment which can either be a statement or a question. And then finally there's mental fabrication, feelings and perceptions. Feelings are feelings of pleasure or pain, neither pleasure nor pain. And perceptions are the labels we apply to things, the images we hold in mind. When we compare perception with directed thought and evaluation, Perception is like words, individual words, where it's the directed thought and evaluation deals in whole sentences. And these things have a huge impact on how we experience things. And all the different voices in the mind, all the different committee members, all our different identities are made up of these various forms of fabrication. And this is where the teaching gets useful. A thought comes into your mind, an emotion comes into your mind, telling you you want to do this, you want to do that. And if you realize that it's not skillful, you can look at it and ask, okay, what kind of fabrication is going into this? One of the reasons we work with the breath and try to get really sensitive to the breath energies is so that on the one hand you can be sensitive to how a particular thought goes along with a particular way of breathing. And if you recognize that it's unskillful, you change the way you breathe, and that weakens the power of that particular thought. This is particularly useful when you're dealing with addictions, because as soon as the desire for a hit comes up, whatever the hit is, you tend to tense up, and that becomes proof that you've got to do something right away to deal with the tension in the body, to deal with a sense of dis-ease. You can short-circuit that by breathing in a way that's really relaxed, pulling yourself out for a bit and saying, okay, I've got, I can breathe in a way that's really comfortable. And that weakens the desire, weakens the need for the, for the hit. And then you can start looking at what the thoughts are saying. So you can see that they're making things up. You don't really have to believe them. So when you think about these concepts of fabrication, remind yourself that these are important tools for learning how to step back out of that particular thought world that goes along with that member of the committee. Because in the Buddha's terms, these members are what he calls becomings. In other words, there's an identity, but there's also a particular world that goes with that. So you have an addiction to, to chocolate. Okay, when the voice that comes in and talks about chocolate, then immediately all the things that are relevant to eating chocolate are part of that world. So you learn how to step out, step back. And John Fuang used to say, it's, Looking at your thoughts, when you learn how to look at them this way, and you step back a bit, it's like watching TV. You don't get into the TV set. Well, I think that's the way he looked at TV. Most people nowadays do get their heads into the TV set, even though they're physically they don't get in there.
It's like stepping back and being a critic, saying, well, this TV show here, how do they make it? What did they do well? What did they not do well? So you don't, don't get involved in the story, believing in the characters and identifying with the characters. You step back and see them as something made up, something put together for a particular purpose. And then you're going to ask yourself, what is the purpose of this? For most TV shows, it's to sell something or to sell you on a particular idea. And then when you start seeing the motivation behind that, then you can pull yourself out and say, I don't want to get involved in that. I don't want to believe that thought world. It's like the events in 9-11. I was staying up at Mount Rainier that day. It turns out in Mount Rainier National Park there was only one TV set that was available for people, and it was, it was in the main lodge. I walked in and saw that they had, I guess it was CNN, had already got the theme music and the headline for the event, and I realized, okay, they're creating a particular world. And I don't want to be part of that. So I turned, out, turned around and walked out. This is when you can see intentions and realize that you don't want to identify with them. You can pull yourself out. And it's a lot easier to pull yourself out when you learn how to look at these various voices in your mind simply as conglomerations of these different kinds of fabrication. Now the trick on the path is learning how to use fabrication as part of the path. After all, right view is a type of fabrication. But it's a particular type of fabrication. It's the kind that can pull you out of other fabrications. Ananda Bindika, who was a student of the Buddha, a lay person who was quite advanced in the practice, was asked one time by some members of other religious sects, well, what does the Buddha believe? What are his, what are his views on things? And Ananda Bindika, who was quite advanced, said, you know, I don't know the entirety of his views. Well, how about the monks? What are their views? You know, I don't know the entirety of their views, but I can tell you about what I believe, how I see things. But first I'd like to hear your views. And so the various members of the sex talked about the hot topics of the day, about whether the, the universe was finite or infinite, eternal, not eternal, whether the soul is the same thing as the body or whether there's a separate soul and a separate body, and what happens to a an enlightened person, when they achieve enlightenment, do they go out of existence? Do they exist both or neither? You look at those questions, and they all have to do with becoming. You know, what is the world? What is the person, basically? Where does the world come from? Where does the person come from? And it goes into a long series of, of related issues. And Ananda Benica said, you know, in each of these cases, when you cling to that view, the clinging itself is going to be a cause of suffering. And in holding on to that view, you're holding on to suffering. So they said, okay, what is your view? He said, well, whatever is fabricated, whatever is put together, leads to suffering. And they said, okay, when you hold on to that view, then of course you're, you're holding on to suffering too. And he says, no, it's a tool. You use it to take apart your clingings. You see the extent to which you can go beyond the suffering. He said, that silenced them. He went later and told the Buddha what had happened, and the Buddha said, that's a good way to answer those people. In other words, right view is a type of fabrication, but it's because it deals in terms that have to do with watching the fabrications of the mind. It contains the seeds for its own transcendence. It allows you to look at fabrications, all other fabrications, and learn how to let go of them, see them, whatever the issues are, even big cosmic issues, and see that the desire to hold on to that particular issue, the desire to get that issue answered, is going to tie you down to suffering. And the issue is learning how to step back from that. You use right view to step back from it, and then you also use right view to take apart your, any attachment you might have to right view. That's what gives you freedom. So that's the skill of the practice, learning which fabrications are useful for the purpose of 
letting go of unskillful fabrications, and these can deal with anything, any of the voices you have in your mind, from ordinary everyday addictions to the bigger addictions, like the issues of where we come from, what's the ground of being in the cosmos. The Buddha has you look at that and what, what's the desire to get that question answered. Where does that come from? That may not be obviously unskillful, but he says as long as there's any kind of clinging in there, there's going to be stress and suffering. You have to learn how to step back from it and just see that as a voice in the mind that's composed of these different kinds of fabrication. And when you get a sense of dispassion or disenchantment with that, then you're, you can let go and you're, then you're free. The image of freedom coming from letting go is one the Buddha usually illustrates with a fire. They had believed that fire clung to its fuel, and when it went out, it went out because it let go of the fuel. All too often we feel that we're trapped by something because the thing is clinging to us, holding on to us. But the image here is the other way around. We're trapped by things that we hold on to. In some cases they're blatantly unskillful, in other cases they seem relatively skillful, but they still cause suffering. So what we're doing is we're working with the breath here. We're actually working with all the different forms of fabrication. The breath itself is the bodily fabrication, and you can adjust that any way you want. And then as you do the adjusting, you're engaged in directed thought and evaluation, asking yourself, is the breath comfortable? If it's not, what can we do with it? How we can change it? And then there are the feelings of relative levels of pleasure as you work with the breath, and the perceptions that you hold in mind. What's the breath energy doing in your body? Where does it come in? Where does it go out? You get more and more sensitive to these processes to see how you're actually engaged in them as you create the state of concentration. That achieves two things. One, it gives you a good place to stay so you can look at other forms of fabrication. And in the course of creating this sense of, of concentration, you become more sensitive to the processes of fabrication. So you use this until it's done its service. And as with right view, then you learn how to take it apart, and then you're free. But don't be too quick to take it apart. A lot of people are afraid they're going to get stuck on concentration. I have a student who's a financial advisor, and he was concerned about getting stuck on concentration. And I said, well, it's like somebody in your, in your office, and they've just received a raise. They've got a new position, and they come into your office and say, how can I move up the ladder quickly? What's the next step up the ladder? Because I don't want to get stuck in this position. And you say, you've got to tell the person, okay, you." The way you move up the ladder is by doing your current position really well. And it's the same with the concentration. You've got to learn how to do the concentration really well before you can move beyond it. So staying here a long time doesn't necessarily mean you're stuck. It simply means you're working on learning how to see these processes of fabrication more and more skillfully. And when you move into deeper states of concentration, say where the directed thought and evaluation falls away, then you see, oh, that is a particular type of fabrication, and this is how it starts, and this is how it ends. When you get to the fourth jhana, and even the breath stops, and all that's left is mental fabrication. And John Lee has a nice image. He says it's like having ore that has lots of different metals in it. And as you heat the ore up after a while, when you reach the melting point of one metal, that'll dissolve and leave the ore. And then you raise the heat a little bit more, and then you reach the melting point of another metal, and that will dissolve. Because the melting points are different, they come out separately. It's the same with these different kinds of fabrication. As you get deeper and deeper into concentration, they fall away. That's how you. One of the ways you get insight into them is seeing how they separate out. 
But the important lesson is that you've got to learn how to use this understanding. And you can use this understanding for all kinds of things in your life, starting with really blatant addictions to some of the more subtle addictions, anything that's causing stress and suffering. So even though the teachings on fabrication may seem abstract, they're really very direct and very good tools for learning how to pull yourself out of the, the thought worlds, pull yourself out of the identities of all the different committee members, using the skillful ones in order to gain more strength over the unskillful ones. And then when they've done their job, okay, you turn on those until you reach the point where you realize, okay, you don't need to take on those identities anymore, because then you're totally free. When I first went to stay with Jean Fu, one of the statements he made that really attracted me to what his, his teaching was that he said, the whole purpose of this is to purify the heart. This is how you purify it. You get it to the place where it's not clouded by any fabrication at all. 